Deeming began and shed light on the earth with God's golden glory and wonderful power. Thick clouds of religious confusion dispersed. Then silence swept them for an awful half hour. The silence is breaking glory to God. The evening is shining again. The trumpet is sounding clear and aloud. The truth shall forevermore stand. A subtle apostasy wrought of our work and quieted over the east jubilee. To us widespread destruction the tale did much hurt. Great carnage was spread over land and north sea. The silence is breaking glory to God. The evening is shining again. The trumpet is sounding clear and aloud. The truth shall forevermore stand. The sixth trump was silenced to slumber so deep. The ten virgins drifted and decades passed by. The seventh trump sounded, cried, wake from thy sleep. Then Zion arose at the thundering cry. The silence is breaking, glory to God. The evening is shining again. The trumpet is sounding clear and aloud. The truth shall forevermore stand. Oh, glory to Jesus, the night is dispersed. The glory is back and forever. The evening shines brighter right now than at first As loud blasts of truth sweep the silence away The silence is breaking glory to God The evening is shining again The trumpet is sounding clear and aloud The truth shall forever the silence is breaking glory to God. The evening is shining again. The trumpet is sounding clear and aloud. The truth shall forevermore stand. Welcome to the Bible Line Machine. Stand upon the sea at last that's mingled with Jehovah's star. Our robes are white, our feet as red. We stand upon the foes in power. We stand redeemed upon the sea. And sound
this bright and glowing plain of heaven's truth and burning love. Our souls in glory ever reign with all the ransom hosts above. We stand redeemed upon the sea. you know stepped into the revelation in the 10th chapter and was told to eat the word and how sweet it would be to his taste and then bitter in his belly or the persecution and that which would follow would be bitter and breaking right on into what we call the 11th chapter I read two verses there was given me a reed like a rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of God the altar and them that worship therein but the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentile, and the holy city shall be tread underfoot forty and two months. Quickly we look at this, and we break into the message by saying at different times, God has deemed it necessary for his man to measure the temple of God, or the church of God. And I might say, even as we look right at the text this morning, those of you that understand the revelation, my friend, know that the basic reason here was there was a great falling away beginning, which would go into 42 months or 1260 years of darkness when the Gentile world or unbelieving world would trod the city of God underfoot. God in his wisdom saw this coming to pass. It was needful that true-hearted people knew what the true measurement of the church of God really is, the true measurement of the altar, and the measurement of the people that worship therein. Now, I can't wipe out I'd like and touch every one of them, but I really want to say that we too are in a time of a specious a deception of falling away, very deceptive falling away. And once again, my friend, come on, you just picture it. The Gentile, unbelieving people who are not saved are treading underfoot the very city of God. Oh, yes, the true church of God is being bruised, beaten trodden underfoot by people, if you please, who profess religion but have no God in their heart, 
they'll tell the pastor, I don't care what you say, I'm going to do it this way. Well, I want you to get your picture this morning as treading underfoot the very holy city, the people of God, the church of the living God. My God, my God, and there's a word there. It says, for it is given unto the Gentile. And I want you to see this morning, and I preach with a burdened heart. You may not believe it. I know a lot of you have downcast me. I've been trodden underfoot for the last three or four months in a great way. It's taken all the grace that God can give me. But, brother, God is with me. God is behind me. And I'll not back up for a bunch of hypocrites. I'll tell you that right now. Brother, it was given to the Gentile. How was it given to the Gentile? By the letting up, falling away. Brother, we can give this precious church of God right over to the hand of unbelieving people. They'll take over, and the church of God will be trodden underfoot, and nobody will be able to see her in a real glory as God wants her to be shown. My heart is deeply stirred today when I see conditions that's going on. And by the grace of God, I'll cry out against it. He said, John was given a reed like a rod, which is nothing more than a symbolic expression of the Word of God. And he was told to measure the altar. I'm not going to preach on it, but I could quickly measure the altar. How we need the altar measured. Why? We got people that's believing in two cleansing, three cleansing, going by three altars. There's only one altar. Jesus Christ is the altar. There's not two altars. There's not three altars. There's one altar. Jesus Christ is the altar. He's the sacrifice. He's the priest. Amen. He's the high priest. And he said, if any man comes by me. He'll go in, thank God, and he'll be saved. He's the door in the midst of all of this confusion. It's right back to Christ and him alone. Then he said, measure them that worship therein. Now I know sectarian and sad to say too many would be church of God preacher. Saying that John was to measure the Old Testament temple. But I'll just knock that clear out of the ballpark with one thought. John wasn't even given the revelation to A.D. 96. The temple was destroyed at A.D. 70. There was no Old Testament temple to measure. It is already out of the picture. The temple he was to measure was the New Jerusalem, the New Testament temple, the church of the living God, made up of born-again men and women, had have sold out to God and are walking in the light. This is the temple he was to measure. And he was to measure it by this reed or rod, the Word of God. I want to say this morning, we can only know, we can only definitely know we may profess lots of things, but we can only truly know that we're God's people. And we're the church of God when we measure to this book right here. Here's the only measuring rod. I know a lot of you being measured today and measuring yourself by someone else. What some preacher said, something else. Here's the measuring rod. And whether we're the church of God or not depends wholly whether we measure to the measurements of this word right here this morning. I hope you'll get it just as we need to get it. There's such a letting down today. It stirs me. I remember my daddy saying, I thought of it in the night last night, even in his day. And brother, it wasn't near as bad then. But he said if the old saints could see what calls itself the church of God today, they'd turn over in their grave. And brother, I'm telling you, if they could see it now, 35 years later, they'd do more than turn over in their grave. No doubt they'd resurrect and come back and do something about it. Friend, you may not believe it, but there's a falling away working in a greater way. Amen. And many people realize. And I say we need to rise and measure. 
rise and measure the temple of God as never before. We need to be reminded that the battle's on. Armageddon is now. And what is a Armageddon? Basically a battle against truth and error. A battle going on with powers that's dealing for your soul and my soul. The devil working through deceptive ways, uh, trying to get us to let down on the standard of God. And we got to make a decision, Church of God. Every one of us. We've got to make a decision. Are we going to glory or are we going to hell? Now we're going to glory, we're going to go the Bible way. That's the only one, any, only way anybody ever got to glory. Come on, just study the Bible. Look at this. Look at current events. And you will be assured where people go that compromise back off of truth will not measure to the Word of God. I say we must bring ourselves to a decision. Where are we really going to go? I say just as sure we're here, we need to study about it. Just as sure as we're sitting in our seats. We want to study this morning a little bit about the bride of Christ, the church, and her adorning. And I preach with a burden. Somebody said you're all stirred up. I am all stirred up. And I would to God I'd get every one of you stirred up. I'd give a whole lot if I get every one of you stirred up that name, the name of Christ, to the place of battling. Not battling each other, not battling any flesh and blood, but battling against spiritual wickedness that's trying to take us place right in among us to clip our power. I want to tell you for sure this morning, I don't want to see the church go down in the muck and mar of this old world like I'm seeing it happening in many other congregations. Whenever I see it happen, my friend, I within a 150 mile radius, I don't want to pinpoint anything. But when I see it happen, a church just going down like somebody would got in the quicksand and see it going down in the muck and mar of this whole world. Somebody say, why you get stirred? Here's why I get stirred. It can happen to you. Come on, you're not immune to it. You haven't got it so settled that you'll never compromise or go down. Not a one of you. Brother, this is a day by day something. You may have been true to God yesterday and compromised today. It's something we've got to deal with every day that we live. It's something, Lord, that we've got to keep our hearts stirred against. Over in Revelation, the 21st chapter, it talks of the bride. And I'll hurry as well as I can, as fast as I can, but it'll take a little time to unburden my heart this morning. In Revelation 21, 2, And I, John, saw the holy city. Here's the church, the new Jerusalem. The Jerusalem brought about by the New Testament, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Here he got a picture of her. He got many different pictures. 19th chapter, he got a picture. And here in the 21st chapter, he gets a picture of her as a bride prepared, adorned for her husband. Now, every one of us know, if we take it from the literal for a moment, bride preparing, a bride preparing for her marriage spends more time and effort on her dress than anything else. I thought I'd hear a bride amen, but I didn't hear it, but it's so anyway. Amen, she spend more time and I'd like to put right behind it this morning, I would to God the church today would get more excited about her dress and preparation for Christ. Here's the bride adorned had prepared herself for her husband or Christ. I want to make it plain right here, and this is against nominal teaching today, but we don't go to glory to get adorned. 
There is no preparation. There is no adorning in heaven. The place for the church to be prepared and adorned is right here in this life. And if we don't meet those conditions right here in this life, we'll never meet them. We'll never meet the Lord in peace, just as sure as we're here. Well, quickly, we look at the inward in Revelation 19 and 7. And I'm leading right up to the message. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed. Now our first text says, as a bride prepared, adorned, arrayed. And it was given unto her that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The fine linen that the bride has prepared herself and is preparing herself is the righteousness of the saints. Now Revelation 19 and 8 said she should be arrayed. The word arrayed means to be put in order, to dress in finery. She was arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. And that fine linen, John said, was the righteousness of the saints. Way back in the prophet Isaiah, in the 52nd chapter, in the first verse, we lay a foundation just a little farther. Here he speaks. He said, Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments. And goes on to say, Shake yourself from the dust and all these things. In other words, here's a picture of the away, array. The prophet says to the church, Awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments. In plain language, he's saying, get the nightgown off and put on the wedding gown. It's time to get out of bed. A picture of a position of resting in action. Taking no action. The God has stirred the prophet to call the church to action as never before. So when we bring these all together, it points to one thing, that we are in a time of preparation, a measuring time, a time for perfect communion. Now, what's all this revelation mean? She's prepared herself for Christ. You get into the Greek, it means nothing more than you prepared yourself for perfect communion with Christ. There's things that will hinder your communion with Christ. You get it straight from the preacher this morning. I know we're in a world where people can talk any way they want to, act any way they want to, do things unseemingly. They'll still hold up their hand. They have perfect communion with Christ. But if we go to the Revelation, the Revelation calls you a liar when you do that. Brother, there's some preparation it takes for you to prepare yourself where you can have perfect communion with Christ as he wants you to have right here on this earth. Over in 1 Peter, as we bring him to the witness stand. 1 Peter, the first chapter. And I'm using the Bible because I want you to turn and read too. But here in 1 Peter, the first chapter, the 10th verse, he's talking about the salvation that we enjoy now. He said, of which salvation the prophets have inquired. 1 Peter 1 and 10. And search diligently who prophesied of the grace that would come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, not unto the prophets, but unto us 
they did minister the things which are now reported unto, the, unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. Now I'll just make a blunt statement. The angels have no desire to look into what's going on in nominal religion today. Ain't nothing about that that thrills the angels. Come on now. Angels, angelic beings that live in heaven, live in that glory that you're trying to get into. There's something about this salvation that's so outstanding, so blessed, so great that the angels desire. The prophets desire to look into it. They couldn't. All they could do is to prophesy of how it would come to us. The angels desired to look into it. They couldn't look into it. Amen. See, this is something to get worked up over. I want to say again, the angels have no desire to look into what's going on in professed religion. Ain't no thrill in that. Ain't nothing outstanding about that. But you get to the place of real salvation. You're talking about something that heaven can afford. Amen. No angel can look into it. Now I know you don't believe that, see. No, it's been so trodden underfoot. Brought down to a common place. I'm here to tell you yet this morning, real salvation is a high experience which the angels desire to look into. Now he said, since all this is true, since the prophets would like to experience it, and the angels would like to look into it. Now you and I need to gird up the loins of our mind. Right here is the greatest thing you can think upon. Brother, if there's any real salvation working in your heart, and you understand the true values of salvation. I know there's things you have to put your mind on. You go into the factory, you got to put your mind on the machine. Are you women working in the home? There's time you have to put your mind. But when your mind is turned loose, where does it run? Now the truth of the matter is it runs everywhere else. Shopping, playing golf, playing ping pong. And then when it comes time to looking into the most precious thing we got, you have to fight, sleep, fight targets. Can't hardly make myself look into it. Now there's only one answer to that. You don't put the real value on. Things that you put the right value on are not hard to look into. You enjoy looking into them. Hey Amen. I ain't hurting anyone. I only preach this way because I love you. I preach this way because you need help. Now he said, since this is true, gird up the Lord in your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Just a little farther. As obedient children. Not fashioning yourself according to the former lust in your ignorance. Brother, there was a time before we would say we was ignorant about a lot of things. We didn't know how to wear our clothes, what kind of clothes to wear. Ephesians 2 and 2 said we just followed the course of the world. <laughs> when summertime begins to come, the world take their clothes off, we take ours off. former time in our ignorance when we didn't understand God's will God's word we were ignorant to the things of God now let's read it as a billion children not fashion yourself according to the former lust what was our former lust for we Christian we lust after the world and the things of the world that we'll be studying Them were former lusts. According to your former lusts in your ignorance. 
But as he with us called you is holy, now get the point, we're going on, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or conduct, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. I want the picture real quick. Now you're a child of God. You've been a partaker of God's divine nature. This is the point Peter's getting to us. See, when he said, as obedient children, that means children of whom obedience is their characteristic. It's their ruling nature. Just as a natural child has the nature of the father and mother. You call them a chip off the old block. What are you actually saying? They got the same nature as the father and mother. Now God says, you're my child. You must be holy because you have my nature and I am holy. Now it's the nature of a holy child to be an obedient child. Right back to Ephesians 2, 2 and 3, we'll not go there. But in times past we were children of disobedience. But now we're obedient children. We've had a change. A real definite change. And since we've changed some things we were ignorant about, we learned the truth about, we don't fashion ourselves like we used to. How many can understand what I'm saying this far? Now, I prayed much throughout the night that God would help me to make this plain. Because I know I'm warring against the spirit that's out here that the things I'm going to preach on this morning are incidental, unnecessary. You can be a Christian without it. Well, I'm preaching on being a Christian right here. It'll change. You'll change the fashion. Now he said not fashion yourself like you used to fashion. I don't set your mind against me. I got something to tell you. In 1 Timothy, the second chapter, the eighth verse beginning, here he talks about what kind of people we must be in worship to God. This is what he's talking about. Started with the bishops and deacons and come right on down to the men, the brethren and sisters in the congregation. You read it all, you'll get it. He said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, they actually uh, braided gold into their hair, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that which becometh women but that which becometh women professing godliness with good works. What's the lesson in those verses? Good dress goes with good works. This is the point he's putting forth. The dress question by too many people is thrown out the window. All I care if my people has a good spirit and works hard, I could care less how they dress. That's a compromise. Good dress goes along with good works. There's a way women must dress that profess godliness. They're not the general run of the herd. They're professing to be God's children. Professing to live godly in this present world. And because of it, there's some things that need to be different, Paul told Timothy. Now, in 1 Peter, the third chapter, these are familiar scriptures, but we want to look at them in our study this morning. Amen. In 1 Peter, the third chapter. Now, let's look here. In verses 1 to 5, Likewise, you wives, here he's writing to wives, be in subjection to your own husband. That if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation or conduct of the wives. While they behold your chaste conduct coupled with fear, whose adorning 
Now here the bride in our lesson is adorned for our husband. We think of adorning in a worldly way. Right away we think about putting on jewelry, painting, fixing up, fine clothes. But here he tells us what the adorning of the Christian woman is. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning. Such a plating the hair with gold and wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Brother, your sister, your adornment needs to be that which is not corruptible. got to get beyond the fine dress, the rings, the paint. All of those are corruptible things. The women of God's true church, their adorning that they put on is not corruptible. A deeper, a richer, a brighter, a greater adorning. And he goes right on and said, which is ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. This is an ornament that every one of God's true sisters in the church, he wants them to wear. An ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. For after this manner, in old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God. Now I want to know right here where your trust is. Oh, Brother Wilson, I don't think there's anything wrong wearing that. And I know a good brother, and he said there ain't nothing wrong in doing this. Where's your trust? Are you trusting in God? If you're trusting in God to know how to live, how to dress, then you have to trust His Word. Not what you feel, somebody else feel, but what the Word of God says. I'm taking my time. After this manner in old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, they adorned themselves with a meek and quiet spirit, being subject under their own husband. Amen. Isaiah, 62nd chapter. Oh, I wasn't going to turn there, but I will. He prophesies right into our day and time and gives us encouragement, especially the ministry. He said in Isaiah 62, For Zion's sake I'll not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteous thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles will see your righteousness and all the kings uh, thy glory. And thou be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will call. Thou also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and royal diadem. Here's your adornment in the hand of my God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken Neither shall thy land be turned desolate, but thou wilt be called Hephzibah and Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land will be merry. You'll be called Hephzibah, you'll be merry, and you'll be called Beulah. The Lord hath delight in thee. There nothing pleases God any more than to see his people walk in the light of his word. Measure to the precious teaching of God's eternal word. Well, every one of these points, you know, people are ready to argue. And I have people say, well, Brother Wilson, I know the scripture says modest apparel, and we have never been guilty of trying to tell you what modest apparel was to the degree that some has that the dress has to be halfway between the knees and the ankle, and the sleeve has to be below the elbow. I've actually preached for people that held that standard. I stand on the Bible that says, modest apparel. Well, somebody said, what is modest apparel? Modest apparel is a human form clothed with the appearance of godliness. So when the world looks on you, you rightly represent God. That's modest apparel. A human form clothed in godliness. So that when the world, back to our text, not only when the world, but when angels. 1 Corinthians 6. 
we need to obey because of the angels. When men and angels look on you, you rightly represent God. Friend, if God will only help me to bring the emphasis back where it needs to be brought on some of these things that people are looking on today as nonchalant. Tonight, if the Lord help me, I got the subject, if I can get the message, I want to preach on where holiness begins. But I'll make it plain to you tonight, our light does not shine out one bit until holiness gets in our body. The world cannot see your spirit, they cannot see your soul. Come on. I'll lift up a standard against this devilish thing that what the body does don't make any difference. My soul say the world can't see your soul or spirit. It's when you get holiness in your body that the world sees your good works and your light begins to shine. Sure that's right. Definitely right. In 1 Timothy 2 and 10, he said in like manner that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, <coughs> not with broided hair, gold, pearls, costly array, but which becometh, which is becoming to women who profess godliness. Come on. And your good dress goes right with your good works. I'll get it right here. Here it is that women, which become of women of professing godliness with good works, he puts them right there together. First Peter, the third chapter, look back at it a moment. I ain't going to go to seed on it, but I want you to get it. First Peter 3 and 5, did you ever hear this teaching? I run into it as late as yet. Now, Reverend, you've got to realize we're in different times. The world lives much different. Customs has so changed. Everything has changed. You know where they lead me up to? Never said it, but I know where they're leading up to me. Trying to make me feel that the Word of God had changed. Well, we preach to you as late as Wednesday night to get your mind stirred in the right way. The Word of God abideth forever. In this changing world, there's some things that don't change. Somebody said you haven't got any Bible for that. Well, look at 1 Peter 3 and 5. For after this manner, in the old time. <laughs> What's Peter doing? Bringing the standard just the same today as it was in old times. Back in old time, how far back? The beginning of faith, Sarah, Abraham's wife. Come on. She professed godliness. And when she professed godliness, she dressed in modest apparel and was in subjection to her husband. Now thousands of years had passed since Sarah's day and Peter's day. But he let us know that God's feeling about had not changed one bit. That just like women that profess it, godliness, amen, certainly. Sarah probably wore her dresses clear to the ground. And we know that customs are different than that today. God's not asking you to wear your dress to the ground like Sarah did. But he's expecting you to recognize God, standard, and dress modest. Modesty will work in any age, anywhere. So he lets us know that it was the same in old time. It's certainly against the teaching that things have changed. We're in a different time. He says, even as in the old time. We speak basically this morning. I'm thankful. God in heaven knows. And I battled this while I was studying this lesson out. I can picture you people. And God in heaven knows I rejoice that I don't look at half of my congregation with painted up faces and loaded with jewels. I thank God for clean people. Well, somebody said, what are you preaching it for? An ounce? 
and how of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Rather, if the Word of God will clean people up that's got into it, it'll keep people clean that ain't in. So it's necessary now and then when God ordains to come down the line and by the Bible measure these things. Now you may disagree with me at first, but I make a statement. The real basis for worldly attire, worldly array, is the love of the world. Still a hold of it. Because we've already studied. When God's Holy Spirit comes into your life, you begin to be holy. And if there's a worldly spirit working you in you anyway, you'll have some hang-ups on worldly things. I make that plain by saying this. It's no good to try to knock things off of you. We've got to go to the heart of the matter. You get rid of the spirit of the world. You get rid of the love of the world. And when you get rid of the love of the world, you'll not love the things, John said, that are in the world. So we got to go beyond things this morning and get where the basis of worldliness really is. See, Jesus in the 17th chapter of John, when he prayed that wonderful prayer for the church, he said, they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Now, we weren't talking about this cosmo out here, this world. God loves the world of souls out here that are lost. But when he said they were not of the world, he was merely saying they've been delivered from the spirit of the world. And until you're fully delivered from the spirit of the world, you'll still have trouble with worldly things you want to hold on to. They'll be valuable to you. What do you mean valuable? Too much to give up. So we want you to see where the real problem is. Look over in 1 John, the second chapter. Another familiar scripture, but let's study it in the light of our study, and I'm hurrying. Here at 1 John 2.15, and remember, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is where he went back off of Patmos, took the reed like a rod, and measured the church. Here he said in 1 John 2, 15, just two verses, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See how John drew that deciding line? Neither the love of the world is there, or the love of the Father. And the love of the Father is there, or the love of the world is gone. Sixteenth verse, for all's in the world. And here he lets us know what worlds he's talking about. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now to understand this, John was writing to a people here in these epistles that understood some things that we may not be so clear on. You can take my word this morning. I preached this thought to you before. But you can look it up. The Jews, and my friend, for many centuries had divided time into two ages. They called the present age that they lived in holy evil. And the age to come or the age of God would be wholly good. Now there's many people who don't have understanding in religion still holding to that. Preachers will teach you you can't live free from sin because we're in an evil way. But when the millennium comes, Christ sets up his kingdom, then it'll be wholly good. Now this was the teaching that was predominant then. And John came teaching that the church, the real church, men and women who had been born again of God's Spirit, had received spiritual understanding that that age which they were looking for to come had already come. The, pray, the kingdom was a present reality. 
Paul wrote in Hebrews 6 and 5 to a people, Christians, and he said, you've already partaken of the power of the world that was to come. That world which was to come has already come. Biblically speaking, that truth is like a ribbon through the New Testament. Now the Christians believed that it had already come. But they also knew that the kingdom wasn't for the world, but for people who had gained experience of salvation. That they'd been brought to a place they were not of the world. But they were of another world, uh, just biblically speaking. The Bible makes very plain to us yet today that there has to be a complete cleavage between the church and the world. Over and over and over, God teaches, come out from among them. There must be no compromise in any way between the church and the world. In many places, the church has lost their real power. Because a compromising spirit has made them believe they could compromise with the world and still go on. I repeat again, the world here is not the world in general. When he speaks of this world, he's speaking of people that have forsaken or refused God. He's speaking of a pagan society, unbelieving society with its false values, false gods and false ways. I can't develop these thoughts as I'd like to, but every day we're, uh, there's someone promoting something about the world way and trying to sell us on the idea we can still be the church of God and go the world's way to a certain degree. This is what John was teaching again. Brother, the same world that was working on the church in John's day that brought the great falling away is the same world that's working on you and I. I know I hurriedly point, point, pinpoint it, but it's a society out here of unbelievers that have either refused God, rejected God, or God's way is unknown to them. Sin. They're men and women without the grace of God. So they live on in sin. The flesh without God's grace is, makes a bridgehead to sin. Lust of the flesh includes the sins of the flesh. Also worldly ambition and selfish aims. To be subject to the fleshly desire is to judge everything in the world by material standards. God help us this morning. We're in a materialistic age, and we're going to have to be careful. You see it happen over and over. I saw people move right away from the Lord's table where they're getting their soul fed. So they're going to get a better job and move out to a condition where their spirituality, I watch it fall. What is that individual doing? Following the lusts of the flesh. There's something about the place, you know. It wants the best job you can get. Make the most money you can make. Hey, Amen. We need a whole lot of that in us. That's the thing that will cause us to wash your face. Shay. See some of these fellas drop in with these beards. I'm almost moved to switch my text and preach on what must I do to be shaved. of the place. We're in a materialistic age, let's face it. And the devil will bring you supposedly good sound reasoning. Well, this is just sound. Who could turn this down? Man, it'd be a fool if he didn't do this. When all the time you're being led out of the order of God's divine will. As I said, I ain't going to stay here a long time. 
But we've got to be careful of this thing. I say it includes the sins of the flesh, also worldly ambitions and selfish aims. To be subject to the flesh's desire, I'm repeating, is to judge everything by purely material standards. To follow the lust of the flesh is to live a life dominated by our senses. I'm trying to make it plainer. How does it work when we're dominated by our senses? Senses, senses, five senses. You'll be gluttonous in food. Effeminate in luxury. Slavish in play. Lustful and lax in morals. Selfish in the use of our possessions. Just drag it all in to make me a better place while there's some over here who don't have anything. You know why there isn't a greater missionary work going on in congregations? The lust of the place working too great a way. See, when this works on you, Peter said in 2 Peter, the first chapter, when this thing begins to work on you, become blind, you can't see afar off. What do you mean? All your lust and your desires is just for yourself. Build up your own home, your own family, your own habits. All of this is done by people today, and sadly, many times people have claimed to be Christians. They live this way regardless of the commandment of God, the judgment of God, the standard of God, or the very existence of God. They trump as it were God under their feet and want and do it anyway. I know you haven't reached that place, but I'm trying to get it clear to you before you ever reach that place. Or you can become so bold and bewildered in such a condition. I say this comes down to anyone who demands a pleasure. I'm still on the lust of the place. Who demands a pleasure which may be the ruin of someone else. How many lives are ruined, especially young girls? Or the young man going to have pleasure no matter what it costs the young lady? Amen, and some do that to claim to be Christians. Don't be deceived. In other when you've got a true Christian spirit, you look out for the other one. This may bring me pleasure, but it's going to bring hurt on my brother. So I'll not do that. This old independent, it's nobody's business there. It's not Christian. You are your brother's keeper. If we get living after the lust of the place, we'll seek our own pleasure, what we like to do. No matter what a stumbling block it might lay in front of somebody else. That's following the lust of the place, brother. Oh, yes it is. Yes it is. Amen. Anyone who lives in luxury while others are in want, anyone who has made a god of his own comfort and ambition, many people have done that. Highways just thickly travel with people who's made pleasure and ambition their god. Up and down the highway. Indulging in this, that. Amen. Second, the second sin and I must hear is the lust of the eye. Or the eyes desire. Here's a tendency to be captivated by outward show. This is a spirit that can see nothing without wishing to acquire it. And then after you acquire it, you flaunt in front of everybody. Amen. Oh, I saw a new dress. It's $125. I don't know how we can ever get it. But you hang on till you get it. Sometimes act up. Act nasty with your husband. And he goes and gets it for a piece off. Hey, man, I've actually worked with situations like that in the congregation. 
Then after you get it, the way you come in the service, everybody knows you got it. Man, I can't pay that much for a dress without everybody seeing what I have. I know that 98% of the sisters can't afford clothes like that. So what? That's their problem. Look at me. The lust of the eyes is causing some of you women to feel you can't come to church without a new dress once a month or once a week. Come on, you know it's so. Your clothes press is overfilled. And you never think of giving a dress away. You take it to a used shop and sell it so you can get some money to get another new I'm preaching on the lust of the eye. Amen. It's a spirit that believes that happiness is to be found in the things that you can buy or the eye can see. The lust of the eyes, my friend, and God has told me in Isaiah 62, I'll not turn there, but to go through, go through the gate, lift up a standard for the people. Now you mark it down, the people will never be able to lift up a standard for themselves. I don't believe it. You never see a congregation rise above its leader. You show me it anywhere. Why? It's God's plan. For the leader to lift up a standard. And if he don't live it up, this whole idea, I just get people saved and let them find the standard out for themselves. They'll never find it out unless you teach it to them. Faith, according to God's eternal word. Under the lust of the eyes comes many, many things. Too many to preach on this morning. But let's just touch some. In 1 Peter 1.14, there he said, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves. Here we are talking about fashioning or making ourselves up. Not fashioning yourself, not making yourself up as you used to. First Peter 3 and 5, we turned and studied it. There he tells us exactly that how we should do like women of old did who lived godly and trusted in God. Now they only made themselves up for one man, their husband. That's what being a subject to their husband means. He's the only subject in their life. They could care less what other men look about them. It's their husband they're dressing for. Now come on, here's where the wrong begins. It wouldn't take near the clothes and the fix-up to please your husband. But when the Spirit comes, you try to fix up to catch Tony's eye. I hope he sees me. I hope Brother Border sees me. He's not my husband, but I hope he thinks I really look nice today. Come on now, here's the real point of it. Amen! Your amen's getting weaker. I'll throw some in. Here's the real point of it. There's a worldly spirit beginning to work on you. You're trying to draw some affection. Some poor man, and maybe weak along that line, is having a terrible battle. Keep his loins girded up and his thoughts right to his wife. Now, we just jump into it real quickly. But there's many worldly practices being worked. I know I've been there in many places called the Church of God. A 100% contrary to the measurements of Twitter. My own daddy, I thought of him in the night. If he could see some, what some of his children's doing, 
how they dress, how they act, their attitude towards the truth. You know what he'd say to me? Emerson, come out from among them. Be separate. Oh, yes. I know how he preached. I sat under him all my life. I listened some time back. And I wept, and I'm working right now to find his address. Well, I want to write him a letter of encouragement. I listened to a tape some time back. Brother Dishman had it. A brother Chester, a wonderful man of God. One of the men that built one of the larger congregations, a large, strong congregation in Oklahoma City. I visited him many times. Close relation with him until somebody went and lied and told a lot of things about me that are not true. They'll have to face the judgment. But anyway, in this message, he had come home from their sectional camp meeting. It ended on Saturday. This was his message to his congregation on Sunday morning. He wept through most of them, poured his heart out. He said, I'm heart sick. I've been in the camp meeting. He said it yesterday in the morning service. He asked me to preach. I preached my heart out. Then for five hours, they all put their bathing suit on, went over to the swimming pool, and mixed together and mixed bathing. Then in the night service, we come back for another hour and a half. He said there's three hours, an hour and a half in the morning, an hour and a half at night, in fellowship with God, and five hours wallowing in the swimming pool. He said, I'm through with it. I'll admit that I've lowered the standard. But I want to tell you people something. I want you to go home and wash the eye paint off. Wash the rouge and makeup off. Get rid of the jewelry. We're going to be the church of God. Well, you know what happened. They didn't get rid of the jewelry. They got rid of him. Threw him right out on his ear. He's pastoring a little congregation out in the country somewhere. Now, this is the kind of spirit I'm preaching against this morning. It'll do the same right here. When that worldly spirit comes in, it takes over. My text said it was given unto the Gentiles. How is it given unto them? Brother, when we give in against the standard of God and let the spirit of the world and unbelievers pull us down from a Bible standard, we're giving it over into their hand, mark it down. And they'll trod the true church of God. That brother's got a broken heart. I want to encourage him. Same thing happened to Charlie Byer. Biggest congregation in the movement. I was in the meeting when he stood up, asked the ministry to give him, forgive him, asked the camp meeting association, 3,500 people, forgive me, I let the standard down. He told his congregation, when I get home Sunday morning, every Sunday school teacher that's adorned, you that know better, either take it off or get out of the class. They didn't get out, they put him out. He died of a broken heart. I visited him on his deathbed. This is the spirit of the world. Amens are short, but it's true. I haven't told you one thing that isn't true. Did you ever stop to think, friend? Did you ever stop to think that every scripture, my time is going fast, but let me get off of this. Every scripture, you check me out, Every scripture that mentions women, women painting their face or painting their eyes or putting on jewelry speaks of evil women, adulterers, every time in the Bible. Amen. In 2 Kings 9 and 30, when Jezebel had the prophets killed, God anointed Jehu king, and his first job was to go get rid of Jezebel. He went to the city where she lived. They told her she's, he was coming. The Bible said she tied her head, she painted her face and eyes, and hung out the window. 
What was she trying to do? Change Jehu's mind. She was going to work sex on him. But he was a man of God. He saw a couple of three eunuchs. I don't know what they are doing hanging out at her house. I'm going to find out about that. There was three eunuchs up there. So he said, throw her out the window. And when they threw her out the window, he let his horse chomp on her. It was chomp the blood out of her. God had said, when you go get her, she'll not be buried. There won't be a thing left of her but her head and her hand. She sent men to, he sent men the next day to bury her. And there wasn't nothing there but her head and her hand. As God has said. I'd like to turn and read every one of these with you. I can. Jeremiah 4 and 30. There's many other lessons. But every one of them, when people painted their eyes and their face, they were ready to live in adultery. Be an evil woman. Now don't go away. Don't want a soul go away this morning and say I was there. I had pain on Brother Wilson said I was a prostitute. I didn't say that. I'm saying everywhere in the Bible that it speaks of women paint their eyes, their faces, and so on. They were playing the part of a heart. You may be without understanding of that. And when you've never had understanding, you're not guilty. But God is endeavoring to get understanding to you. Painted women with painted faces and painted eyes is not a true mark of the church. It's a mark that there's worldliness still working there. That needs to be cleared up. In Jeremiah 4 and 30, hear God's lamentation and misery over Judah. And when thou art spoiled, what will you do? Here's what happens to you when it gets spoiled. Thou closest thyself with princom, thou decketh thee with ornaments of gold, thou rentest thy face with pain. And what are you doing? And thy lovers will despise you. What did you do it for? For many lovers. But God said, I'm going to move on the heart of them lovers. They'll despise you. They'll hate you. And judgment will not be withheld. Ezekiel 23 and 40. Here God speaking again. Speaking of <coughs> Samaria and Jerusalem. Speaking of their sins. And he gives the picture. In Ezekiel 23, 1 to 4, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, there are two women, the daughters of one mother. Here was the divided condition. They committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. And uh, there were their breasts pressed. And there they bruised the teats of their virginity. And the names of them are Ahola and Aholabah. Their names is Samaria and Jerusalem. What was he doing? Setting up a parable against Jerusalem and Samaria. What did he say? They were living in whoredom when I found them down in Egypt. I cleaned them up, straightened them out. Now they're living in whoredom again. They've been spoiled. How you know they've been spoiled? They've started to deck themselves, paint their faces, paint their eyes. And what are they doing for? They want strange lovers. What do you do worldly things for? Because you want the love of the world. When the Bible says the world will hate you. But you're going out to win the love of the world. By compromise to the level of the world. We could go on and on. That isn't necessary. Scriptures, my friend, over and over, lets us know that only evil women practice painting of the face and the eye. Now, 1 Peter 3 and 5 definitely teaches it we must not follow them but follow godly women and adorn ourselves as they did nothing can be gained from the scripture that would commend 
painting the face and the eyes of Christian women. Last time I preached in Warsaw, I come down on this, and a compromiser got up and said, well, we've heard a lot of things, but I think if the old barn needs paint, you ought to paint it. Well, I jumped up and I said, if I'd have called you women old barn, I think if the old barn needs paint, it ought to be painted. Now, come on. Look it up in an encyclopedia. I'll be done shortly. Some of you squirming in your seats. Look it up. Even encyclopedia. Worldly intelligence. will tell you very plain about people who paint themselves. First, they say women will paint themselves to attract the opposite sex. See, when you go painting yourself up, if I come tonight, and I don't think I will, I might, but I don't think so. But if I come tonight with my eyes painted, come on, i got as much right as you have. Oh, yes, I have. God don't hold no more standard on me than he does on you. But if I do come with red cheeks and black eyes and blue, black and blue, we think it's terrible when somebody beats you that way, but painting wonderful. Now the encyclopedia said there are just two kinds of people that paint their faces. First, women to attract the opposite sex. See, the truth of the matter is, sister, you're not satisfied with yourself as you are. You think you're pretty ugly. See, you can't paint yourself up to make yourself look more like you than you are. You're not satisfied with yourself. So you paint up to look like somebody else. See, I'm good looking. I don't fix up. I'm good enough. You're all laughing, but old boy ain't laughing. Man, she kisses this and makes it all over. Two kinds of people, the encyclopedia says, that paint their faces. Women do it to attract the opposite sex, and men have been known to do it when they go to war. That's all that paints the faces. You all had the same opportunity as me when the Queen of England was here some time back. Over and over, reporters asked her the same question and she gave the same answer. Ma'am, why don't you use some makeup and paint your eyes? Her answer was every time, I'll never stoop that low. That's what the Queen of England said. I do not want, she said, the public to think I'm an evil woman, because I'm not. It was in your newspaper. Amen. God's word is plain, dear ones. We can easily see what he wants us to do about this thing. Godly women in all ages wore hair, wore clothing. Uh -huh. Yep. I'm going to say it again. I'm just they hurt me, brother. Did you hear me? What did I say? You don't know either, see? That's what I'm talking about. I waste my time sometimes. Godly women in all ages wore hair and wore clothes. Now today, now I mustn't get on hair because it's too late. But today we just kind of do things the way we want to. We can live, and I'd like to go on to the pride of life because it's stronger than either one of them too. It's too late. 
We just kind of do it the way we want to. But friend, when we fall into a biblical chute where God divides us, we fall into that chute that we're following the lust of our flesh. Oh, I don't believe it. Daniel, the fourth chapter, and I'll not go any farther. When God took Nebuchadnezzar because he raised up in pride, now, I'm not going to preach on the pride of life. It's a bad one this morning. But when he raised up in pride, God said, I'm going to put him out like an animal. I'm going to take his human intelligence away from him. He's going to eat straw or eat grass like the ox. Now you read right on, and it happened to him because he raised up again in pride. Look what I've done. God smote him at the very hour. He went out and eat grass like an ox. His fingernails were like bird claws. I saw him yesterday. She was a stenographer. She had fingernails like bird claws. You can't grow them, you buy them and stick them on. I want to show you what the world's trying to do to you. This is what happened to a man when he lost his right of reason. Living like an animal. His fingernails were like bird claws. <laughs> Some of you are real peace. Some of you are full and some of you are fed up. There's a difference. Bird cloth. See where our world is going. When we reject God in His way, we fall to the animal level. His fingernail was like bird cloth. <laughs> And his hair was like eagle feathers. Today you call it a shag. Oh yes, you look just like an eagle. Your hair cut fine down. You call it a shag. Amen, amen. See, I told you. I'll give you a warning before I started. It's God's Word, and I won't back off of one thing I've said. God still measures the church. He knows what the church of God is more than any of us do. See, we've got new names for it. There wouldn't be one of you women walk down to a body shop, saloon. What do you call it? Salon. I'll get it. Excuse me. Salon. And say, I want my hair cut like eagle's feathers. But they do it. Call it a shag. Amen. Friend, I'm going to tell you right now, this thing affects us in a greater way than we realize. And it'll affect us more and more unless the standard is lifted up, lifted up, lifted up against us. Show me one congregation of people anywhere that's still got power with God. That have backed off of truth. Called even some of the things I preached this morning as a little thing. Don't need to be mentioned. You take me to a one of them where they've backed off and show me any power with God. I'll show you a place where when you go in, your heart's heavy. It's heavy while you're there. Instead of getting filled up, you come home drained. The world this morning, I'm through. Not through, but I'm going to quit. Some other time, I'm going to preach on the pride of life. I got it on my outline. But the world this morning is a spirit that's endeavoring to make inroads into our Christian life. I repeat again, the devil don't think want to tear your whole experience down overnight. If he can just find a small way to get into it and start a work, it's just a matter of time. 
very castle you built. I love every one of you. I'm not preaching to any individual. God knows. I'm preaching against the spirit that wants to take the city, trod the real holy city underfoot, make it worthless. When to me, to me, the church of God is the most valuable thing on the face of the earth. It costs more to buy it. It costs more to build it. It's the most valuable thing on the face of the globe. I say let's lift up the standard. While the power of evil is endeavoring to pull it down, let's lift up the standard in our lives. All about it. May God help us, Father. We didn't get finished, but we just leave the message.